Hello traders and welcome to this Foundations of Technical Analysis webinar on Daily FX. Today is um, Friday, October 13th and I'm Michael Boutros, Currency Strategist with Daily FX. Good to be with you guys here this morning. Pramendra, uh, good morning sir, Marino, Mohammed, great to see everyone here in the room, Asif, Pete, Gary, not going to get to everyone, big crowd, but great to see you guys here. So, my favorite webinar of the week. Um, we do this webinar bi-weekly, uh, and again, it's really made for you guys. I come here with just a couple of concepts and ideas that I want to touch upon, um, and I really rely on your feedback, your questions on what kind of things you want to discuss. So I encourage you, uh, any questions or trade setups or anything that you'd like to discuss throughout the course of this session, you know, our focus will be on technique. So with regards to this specific webinar, you know, we've done, uh, this is the fifth installment uh, of the Foundations of Technical Analysis uh, webinar series. Um, our focus for today um, will be on trade execution. So if we, you know, visit just really briefly, um, you know, the previous uh, webinars that we did, we went over um, you know, basic trend line analysis and slope. Part two talked about identifying confluence regions and really went into depth into opening range uh, trades. We went to Fibonacci and RSI the following time, really going over the intricacies of how we use these and the subtleties uh, that these indicators can offer. Um, two weeks ago, we went over risk management and really how to effectively place your stops, how to effectively really try to deter you from some of those behaviors that really can lead to some poor trading habits. So today's session, as I said, we'll be focusing on trade execution. And this is um, you know, a topic that was brought up by your comments and your feedback. So, um, and very often, a lot of questions I get throughout the course of the week and trading month is basically based on these things. So just some few things that I wanna to touch on today. Um, identifying entries and exits, certainly, you know, we've talked about this in previous webinars. We're not gonna really be talking about how to uh, necessarily locate these but we'll be talking about what to do when we're there, okay? So where do we want to, how do we want to actually, what's the trigger that's going to make us push that buy or sell signal, right? So executing. Um, timing, you know, something that people tend to over uh, or underlook, rather, excuse me, um, on a normal basis. So whether we're talking about the weekly, monthly, daily, hourly opening ranges, when do we want to open a trade? When do we want to close a trade? Um, you know, these things we also want to take obviously into account besides price action where we are in time. So we'll do a quick uh, touch on that. The trigger, you know, what event, what inevitably puts us in the trade? Um, whether you're using a momentum signature or whether you're using, you know, just near term price action, there's got to be something that's pressing, uh, that's telling you to jump into the position. Examining price action around trend lines. This was a very prevalent topic and a question I've been getting throughout this series. Um, and we'll definitely be looking at some examples from some setups that we've been uh, following this week. Uh, you know, one thing I do want to address is, you know, how we trade around these trend lines. Um, and the biggest sort of variable that we want to discuss is time spent at the trend line versus times tested, the amount of times or the number of times it has been tested. So we will go over that as well. Ascertaining exhaustion and pullback plays. Another very, very common question is, Mike, you know, the broader trend is up. I see that you're noting resistance here. What do I do? How do I take advantage of that near-term pullback and price action? Uh, I will go again, some examples on that, specifically in Dollar Swiss actually played out really well this week. Um, so we'll go over that one as well. Last thing is scaling out. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of scaling out of uh, winning positions, not scaling into losing positions, which is something we talked about uh, last week as, um, you know, as basically habits to avoid. You know, we only want to be, be, you know, scaling into a losing position. It's just not, you know, nine times out of ten, it might work once or twice, but, you know, overall, uh, that will be something that could hurt and hinder your performance. So just something to keep in mind there. Uh, Robbie says, trend line on Euro is a good one right now uh, since it's near the downtrend um, since near the down trend line or downtrend line. So leave your questions or, you know, feel free to post them, um, but I will write that down. Euro dollar for Robbie. If we have time, we'll take a look. Um, along with these things that I wanted to discuss today, we'll be looking at specific examples on these on the last couple of pieces that I've been writing here on daily effects. So we'll talk about dollar yen. We'll talk about dollar Swiss, which was the favorite play. 
uh, the Ethereum and breakout and as well as Bitcoin, which has continued to rally to fresh new highs. Um, so lots to look at. Sterling in says, huge move, says Mohammed. Yes, yeah, the Sterling in general. We've been talking about the long side of that for, for weeks, it seems like. So it's finally starting to pan out pretty well um, on that front. All right, so um, again, let's jump right in. So the first thing um, we want to do here is kind of just jump into the live charts. Seeing is believing, and I'm a big uh, advocate of kind of uh, really examining this in person as opposed to talking it from a conceptual standpoint. I'm going to bring your attention to this piece that I wrote here. Um, I guess this was uh, right on the um, onset or right ahead of uh, non-farm payrolls. Um, we were looking at Dollar Swiss and here is a major play. And this is an example um, of, that I wanted to address of people asking, well, how do I play the pullbacks? You know, how do I take advantage of these pullbacks in price action? At the end of the day, this is just kind of a quick walkthrough, guys. I'm going to kind of walk you through how this trade setup panned out and how we kind of traded it. But the first thing is first, going back to that slide, you know, identifying your entry and exit points. Before you get into position, those levels need to be mapped out, period, end of conversation, exclamation point. Paragraph close. Uh, there's nothing more important than knowing A, where your risk is, and B, what your target is on any given trade. So heading into uh, the NFP report, we highlighted this region just above the 98.13 region. Just higher, you had the 200-day moving average, and certainly you know, was a nice confluence region, both on downtrend resistance off the highs and on uptrend resistance off the lows. So you had both of those levels converging on a clear pivot in price and the 200-day moving average. These are the trades where you want to see exhaustion. Okay, so what do I mean by exhaustion? It means that the market has been rallying, you're coming to a major key resistance, there's still room to the upside and a major event risk on tap. So if that major event risk were to fuel a sudden surge in continued dollar Swiss strength, that would be an opportunity to try to fade it or an opportunity to try to, um, you know, basically take the other side of the trade, play on the pullback. Uh, and these are the trades that you want to be very cautious of. One other thing that we don't tend to, to really go into uh, more detail on is um, leverage. You know, leverage is a huge part of your strategy, guys. If every trade you take is X lots and you're glued and you're married to that leverage size, you're doing yourself a disservice, especially if you're trading on a near-term basis where we can, in fact, take trades against the broader trend, right? So we're going, we're going to take those counter-trend trades every now and then. We're going to want to be really be careful on those trades. Obviously, you have to reduce your leverage. So always be mindful of the leverage play. Um, that's all I'll say on that. As far as the near-term price action was concerned, here's what we were looking at heading into NFPs. Again, 200-day moving average is at 98.33. Um, you know, that 98.13 level, you had also the confluence region of resistance here, both upslope and downslope resistance. So how do we actually execute this? These are where the near-term charts, guys, come into play. Okay? So the exhaustion point was right here. You're never going to see entries on these trades, okay, unless you drill down deeper in price. I want to caveat this by saying anyone here who's trading on the fundamentals or if you're trading on a longer term time horizon, this is not going to necessarily be the way you want to address things, okay? Because if you have a risk tolerance of two or 300 pips, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how we intraday trade these near term levels. So looking at this again, um, how did we get into this? Well, jump into a 30 minute chart. Risk to reward is always your, your major key play, right? Heading into the release, we talked about that 98.13, 98.30 level. We're looking to fade a rally into that region. So your prop, you know, the question I get most often is, Mike, you know, price popped through. So how do I know whether this is a breakout or whether I should be looking to fade the, to the downside? Obviously, we talked about the initial inclination was to be looking for that exhaustion. But how do I identify when I actually want to get into the trade? Well, that's 
an examination of near-term price. So I'm gonna bring this down even to a five-minute chart, guys, or a 10-minute chart, just to give you an example of exactly how this one played out. So we're heading into that major key resistance region, okay? Um, and as we head into that major key resistance region, you're looking at that confluence, and you're looking to see how price reacts. So we surge through, we pull back, on the next surge, you don't know where the high is going to be. You don't know if that high is going to hold. So the trade is on a resistance hold below that high. This, for me, was where I actually jumped into the trade, a little bit lower. Okay? So you're probably asking yourself, Mike, well, you know, you like 98.30. Why did we forego that and wait for this pullback all the way back into 98.16 or 98.15, I think was the actual entry? Well, because we need to see that reaction. Okay? We need to see that conviction in price action to give you the entry, okay? If I were to try to take a short into this position on initial stretch, where's my stop? You're just you're going to throw a stop on a risk reward of three to one, so you're just going to basically do that. And we talked about that last week, how that's the op, you know, that's the last thing that we want to do. Um, so, Sorry about this, guys. Hold on one sec. Okay. Um, so, moving along. Um, the entry, like I said, would have been on this move here with your stop against the high. Now, what did we talk about last week with mistakes to avoid? As opposed to thinking, or in the previous webinar, we talked about risk management. As opposed to thinking, oh, I'm looking for a move into 97, so my stop should be X pips away. No. You think the exact opposite. My stop needs to be against this high. Does my limit fulfill my risk to reward ratio? Well, if we zoom back out into this, if you guys remember, the, the initial target on a downside move from that reversal uh, was 97.73. Secondary target was actually down at 97. Um, now, obviously, we talked about this in the webinars that I, I do every morning, and we, we, we had gotten out of the trade on a 100% extension once we start to level off here near 70, uh, 97.42, excuse me. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to play the rest of this downside, but you know that's another concept we'll walk into in a couple of minutes is scaling out. Uh, the point I wanted to make is the entry. You can't do anything on the initial test of resistance. It's the back test here, and once we finally break, that's where you look to take the entry against the highs. So let's say you missed non-farm payroll high. It was a really fast moving market. You know, I don't blame you if you missed it. Um, and we opened up this week citing still a downside bias below that region. So you did have another opportunity to get into this trade early in this week once we rallied up uh, into 98.07 with a stop against 98.30. Okay, 27 pip stop. Again, you're looking for that move into 97 or the lower parallels, basically what we suggested as the major target on this one. So, is there any questions on this? On the basics here, uh, as far as identifying turns in price. Well, again, we'll go over um, you know, more examples for sure. Okay. Uh, just going through your questions here. Robbie saying, no, just a good example. Okay, on the euro, I got you on that. How about gold? Isn't um, there bearish divergence? We'll talk about gold if we have time, Keen. I got you. Let me write that down real quick for Keen. Again, most of the trade setups we want to cover, guys, we'll be going over in the, in the weekly webinar on Monday. Uh, again, for those of you who are new to this session, um, here is the link for the foundations of technical analysis, the last previous webinar we did. Um, also take note that it's got the links um, for the weekly webinar right here. So if you want to sign up for that Monday webinar that we do, uh, we go a little bit more into intricacies of actual setups that we're ready to go. Uh, hey, Keen, you're more than welcome, man. You're more than welcome. Uh, so, moving on. Um, judging the validity of a trend line. Okay, I'm going to stop real quick and take this question uh, from Andrew. Andrew has a great question. It says, are you uh, never worried about reversing on you 
or you just accept that um, that will happen from time to time and just take your stop punishment, bad boy. Listen, this is a very good question, Andrew, and I'm glad you, 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 you asked it because it's something that you always need to address. The concepts and um, tools and strategies that we talk about here, nothing's 100%. So Andrew, if you're getting to a trade and you're saying you're worried that it's going to re reverse upon, uh, against you, what that tells me, and I'm not, I'm not picking on you anything, is that um, your risk management isn't well defined. Every time you jump into a position, guys, you know where the risk is before you get out. So are you worried? No, I know if the market reverses, I'm taking out against the highs, 98, right? Um, and at the, with the same respect, if, if you're having a lot of problems uh, or, you're, or you're feeling, okay, that sign of that anxiety, as it were, when you take into a position, another indication of that is that you're trading with too much leverage. So it's always, you know, when I get these questions of, oh, I'm in this trade, but I'm really worried about getting in because it might reverse. Well, then either one of two things, you're over leveraged or you don't have a well-defined stop and you don't have a very strong conviction on the trade. And those are two things that we're always going to insist before we enter our position, right? We have conviction on the bias, we have a clear-cut, well-defined stop, um, and a clear-cut, well-defined limit. And let the market do what it's gonna do. Andrew, you have to accept the point that you're gonna take stops. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna take losses. It's an inherent part of the business. If you're someone who doesn't like to lose, then this is not the right market for you. Um, now, I'm not telling you that you should like it. Losing sucks, no one likes to lose money, but um, you know, you have to, always appreciate what you're working with and you have to have a respect for the markets. The markets are going to do what they want to do. They're going to move the way they want to move. All we're looking to do is take advantage of those short-term price movements. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, he says, okay, I need some more confidence tablets. I mean, it comes with time. Um, you know, I'm always a big, a big um, fan of basically keeping a journal you know, knowing why the trade went against you. Maybe it didn't do anything wrong. Maybe the market just reversed. Maybe there was a news announcement or some central banker come out and said some nonsense and it moved the markets. So kind of having an idea of what, you know, when things go wrong, why they went wrong is always a good, is always a good um, sort of practice so we can avoid making those same mistakes twice. Um, any questions here on, on entry or trying to trade the reversal, trying to trade a trade into uh, major resistance? Obviously, this is in an uptrend. We talked about that time and time again. Um, but, well, what does that mean? You know, when we get to the uptrend, how do we play the pullback? You know, if you're a longer-term trader, you're not doing this. You're looking for the pullback to get back on the long side. If you're a near-term guy like me or someone who's a little bit more on the, on the closer time frames, certainly that opportunity is there to play that near-term pullback against the larger trend. Okay, Richard, uh, I'm gonna address that question because I feel like we, we mix the two too often. So Richard's asking, um, you know, as far as uh, wasn't today a great opportunity to go constructive dollar Swiss, one way to use uh, news reports. Um, so this is what I would say with news reports. You guys know where I stand on that. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, my career has been censored on the, on, centered on the technicals, um, but we do need to know when these economic releases are out. Um, and for me, our game plan, and again, to my subscribers, this is something we've been talking about for a while, our game plan was to basically fade strength in the dollar starting this week. Why? I'll bring your attention to the weekly chart that we talked about on the webinars. Again, getting a little off topic here, but I think it'll be helpful. Um, and the DXY, you know, we came into the week looking for that exhaustion high or to ver validate that we made that exhaustion high last week, right? Broke below a multi-year trend line within the confines of the descent. Here's the median line. Once we broke below it, we saw acceleration. 50 line caught support, rally back up, right at resistance. And the yearly low week close from 2016. So again, the multi-time frame approach that we talked about, you know, starting off with the weekly chart, getting deeper into the intraday charts, then jumping even deeper into the uh, two-hour or hourly charts to really get your, um, to really get your entries. So um, to move on to dollar Swiss, for example, um, you know, the inherent, 
you know, focus for me was down into that 97 region. Again, we didn't get it. We saw the median line offer a pop higher. But again, the broader view here, in my opinion, is you still look for a move uh, lower here in dollar Swiss. You are testing support at the end of the day. You know, just a test of the monthly opening range would still take you down into 96.80. And lo and behold, 96.80 is not only the opening range low and the monthly open, but it's also a basic 38.2 retracement of the entire advance. Okay. Um, a question here from Robbie saying, if you are going to try and time pullbacks, you have to use tick data uh, and do counts on the up and down price per bar to give you clues where sellers are coming in or where buyers are coming in. So Robbie, essentially that's what we're doing. I would really, cautious, I would really caution clients about jumping too much into tick charts. Uh, it's a real quick way to mess with your head, man. And, you know, largely speaking, even, you know, having sat on the trade desk for years, a tick chart is just a dangerous from a mentality standpoint uh, because you're very susceptible to seeing large moves that look like they're massive on a tick chart and it really tends to sway with your bias. So I tend to sit back and kind of just give a focus on what's going on in price. Then I'll jump into a five minute. I try not to get any deeper than five so I don't get kind of faked out with that price action. You know what I mean? Uh, but Robbie, that's what I would say to that. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Okay, would you recommend using moving averages to supplement the su resistance and support lines and to confirm right entry? So Sam, great question. Uh, when we talk about, you know, and then again, Sam, this is just my humble opinion, my, my personal strategy. Uh, when you talk about moving averages, I'm not a real big fan of trading moving, moving average crossovers and things of this nature. However, on the daily charts, I do think there is uh, some decent merit to using moving averages, specifically the 50, uh, the 200 day, uh, the 100 day. These tend to be important moving averages the markets are looking at, and rightfully so. Um, even if you look at a, you know, a 20 day moving average within trending markets, typically a 20 day moving average will offer some decent support. So sometimes I'll just take it out to the daily chart, tack on a 20 day moving. We see continue to see price action finding support at that region. It's typically an indication that the broader trend still remains on the constructive side. So um, does, that, does that answer your question, Sam? I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, the, the, the problem I've seen with using moving, over, moving average crossovers, for example, as a strategy, this is a very lagged, it's a very delayed indicator. So a lot of times by the crossover having already happened, you have already missed your ideal entry. Certainly I like to look at the slope or the trajectory of the moving average. And then again, yeah, in those longer term, certainly they do tend to offer some very nice resistance and support. Okay, I hope that offers some questions. Hey, you're more than welcome, sir. How do I draw your Fibonacci level, says Al. So Al, um, I'm going to refer you to, um, again, the Foundations of Technical Analysis webinar that we did on Fibonacci. We actually went um, into deep uh, detail on that, Fibonacci and RSI. So here's the link, a whole, presentation just based on the Fibonacci. He says, okay, Ness, nice, thanks, thanks. You got more than, more than welcome, sir. My pleasure. So, another concept I wanted to touch on, I think that, you know, we tend to overlook a lot um, when trying to ascertain entry at one of these levels is time spent versus the number amount of times a trend line is tested. And this is something I think there's a lot of mass, um, I don't want to say confusion, but misconceptions on. Bring your attention to the Aussie dollar. Um, you know, this is a setup that we had highlighted um, a few weeks ago. Uh, we talked about the fact that, you know, Aussie had been holding within this near-term ascending channel formation. In fact, one of you guys here in the webinar, Pooja, I'm not sure if you're here, helped us identify this one. Um, and it's a perfect example of what I want to talk about today. So you hear a lot of different interpretations of how people view um, how to gauge, hey Pooja, there she is, says, here I am, how to gauge um, the strength of a trend line or, you, or, or what you want to do with a trend line. And the thing to focus on is two things. Um, there's a difference between the amount of time that price is spending at a trend line and the amount of times that trend line is tested. The amount of times a trend line is tested on separate occasions 
give you an indication to the amount of conviction to put on that trend line. Now there's a caveat to that, okay? The number of times it's tested, each subsequent test of that trend line typically will have lesser efficacy. What do I mean? Um, well, I think this is, uh, I guess, an example that my colleague Paul Robinson uh, shared in his webinar this morning. It's like a boxer, okay? He's going to get hit so many times, but at some point, that last hit is going to knock him down. Or it's like a door, a doorway. You're holding a sledgehammer. You're going to take one sledge. You're going to hit it a second time. Might hold the third time. Might hold the fourth time, um, but it's getting weaker, right, on every subsequent test. Um, and the example of that here in Aussie dollar is really apparent. Okay, here's that ascending median line formation or ascending channel formation. I'll bring this out even to a 60 minute to give you a little bit more clarity. And we can see trend line support tested once, trend line support tested twice. Now I have conviction on this slope. Remember, uh, back to the first foundations of webinar or the foundations of technical analysis webinar, we talked about um, you know basic trend lines and how to identify um, the validity of one. Two points is speculative. Three points confirm. So taking a parallel of that to the highs, sees again a test here, a test here. Third time you push through a little bit, it's getting a little bit less effective. And then what happens into the start of this, into the end of this week here? You do this, a perfect example. So there's a difference between the number of times the trend line is tested, that gives you conviction on whether the slope is in fact the gradient the market is following, um, you know, and it gives you more conviction on that slope. The more time is spent there, the more likely it is you'll see that trend line give out. Does that make sense? It's a very, very subtle difference in the way you're thinking about it, but I want you to take note about the difference between, you know, a lot of people say, well, the market's been spending, you know, has tested that trend line three times, it's got to break. Ah, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I'd say that it's tested it three times, so it's given me affirmation that that slope is correct. But if it were to break, because of that conviction and that three-point touch, I'd expect the market to do something, right? I expect to see an acceleration. Um, and then with the same respect, the more time is spent sitting at the trend line, the more susceptible it is to breaking. Okay, so there's two aspects here that are very important to note. Um, you know, when you see a test of a trend line, what you inherently want to see is a very low tolerance reaction. So the market has very low tolerance at that level. Uh, when you get there, you, re you either get a strong reversal or pullback, or when you see the break, you want to see acceleration. You want to see it fueled. So when markets come into resistance and they sit there, the longer the time is spent at that level, again, the more susceptible it is to a sub top side break. Does that make sense? Um, very important aspect there. So I hope that helps. Um, and then that's what's going to really give you the conviction on the entry or the exit is by looking back in the historic price action. How many times have we tested this price at this level? What did price do when we got there, right? And then when you get this price action where it's kind of just sticking at the median line. Well, basically, you're just, you know, you know it's ready to go. So you're waiting for that inevitable topside break. Okay. One other thing that we want to talk about as far as your exits and entries and execution is timing. And this is a lesson I can tell you that I've personally learned over the years. Um, you know, early on, it's something that a, a great trader I sat with on the desk for a while would always instill in me, but I never really believed him and never really followed it for, for years until I, you know, had to learn the hard way. And that is, um, you know, basically building on the concept of opening ranges, guys, but, but note of being cognizant, let's say, of when you're executing your trades. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back again to the dollar Swiss trade. Again, this was sort of my favorite uh, one this week. Um, and I'll, I'll jump in even, even deeper into like a, a 10 minute chart. So, when you jump into a position, you want to be there, um, how do I say this in words that make sense? Um, you want to look for the entries to be on the extreme. So, monthly. 
weekly opening range. We talk about the weekly opening ranges. We talk about uh, the daily opening ranges, but there's also hourly opening ranges. Now, hourly opening ranges aren't something that's going to help you actually get a position on, but what it does suggest is the same phenomena that we talk about with the extremes in price being um, in time early and late in the month, early and late in the week, early and late in the hour. So if I'm holding a short position and the market's going in my favor, okay, I'm in the money, um, a lot of times you'll get you know, a couple of decent profit, maybe you've attained a quarter of the ATR, um, and that's your first target. Your first inclination is to want to get out, and I'm the biggest advocate of sticking to your guns. But it has been so helpful in my trading over the years to simply wait for the hourly close. Why? Because the same phenomenon that we talk about, that happens also on an hourly basis. A lot of times the markets will continue to stretch into that direction into the close of the hour doesn't necessarily mean it's going to close 10.59 at the low, but certainly if the market's on the way down and I'm in the short and it's 10.30, 10.25 and I'm still in the trade, like more than likely than not, you know, I'm a big fan of kind of waiting out, let's see where the hour, the, the, the hour pans out and typically, again, nothing in trading is 100%, but more often than not, I found in my personal experience that if you just give yourself that patience and wait for the push into the last you know, a couple minutes of the hour, a lot of times you'll get another, you'll squeeze out another nice, you know, nice push into the trade. Uh, and again, don't take my word for anything, guys. Always look at what the market is saying to validate anything anyone is saying to you. Um, an example of that, again, would be, you know, right here, uh, let's talk about this. So here's the weekly opening range for the Swiss since the start of the week. Uh, now, again, we were short since last week. We took a little bit off it before the weekly close at 97.70. And as I told you earlier, uh, I was looking for 97. I ended up taking the rest off at 97.40. But let's say you were looking for fresh entry, okay? Well, you get a break of the weekly objective opening range low. So the opening range shifts our focus to the downside, okay? So we get this move. We're not going to chase. You don't sell a break. You wait for the test of that as resistance to get short. And once we saw that rally fail again, even if you caught it late on the pullback, the test here, stop against the highs, keeps the focus lower. Now, let's say I did that. Let's say on the last rally here, uh, we opened up a position at 9, 10 a.m. in the U.S., okay, with a stop against the overnight high that we made uh, in Europe. When do I close that trade? A quarter of the ATR was around 30, 33 pips on this one. So if we move lower, well, as soon as I get that 30 pips, should I jump out? Well, if that was a level that you were looking at and 97.40 was, it was 100% extension just to show you what I was looking at, the reason I closed out that position there. There it is, 97.41 was this 100% extension. So if this is just a correction ABC, two equal legs down, that's the first level I'd want to do. Do I cut the whole position out? No. But the point being is that 9 o'clock, we took that trade at the early in the hour. Where do we close the hour? 10 o'clock was at the low. Okay. The next hour comes into play, and you're still kind of sliding lower. Guess where we made the low in that? 10.50. So for the last two hours after the entry, the lows were made at the close of each hourly candle, or at, at the close of each hourly time block. So while you might have gotten faked out and said, wow, we closed at the end of the, of the, of the 10 o'clock, of the 9 o'clock hour, Mike, it's 10 o'clock, I got 40 pips, I'm going to book it. There's actually nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to show you is a little shift in thinking, a little subtle shift in, okay, well, if momentum is in oversold territory, that means there's a lot of push behind this. And, you know, we started off the hour with not much of a rebound. On a trade like that, sit in it. Sit in it. Wait for the close of the 10 o'clock hour. And, and certainly, like I said, again, towards the end, 10.50 um, a.m. is when you put in the low. So that patience to kind of trust what the market's telling you in near-term price action. Um, now, scaling out of a position, um, and that's what we did here. 
on the initial entry that we took when we were looking to fade the FOMC rally, which was you know the beautiful play, the initial entry, the initial exit was 97.73. But guess what? The reaction and the daily chart performance that you saw on that tag, we actually closed lower on the session after breaking to month, monthly, uh, you know, multiple month highs. So what that says to me is I actually think this is going to be a little bit more of a concerted high. Instead of taking out the whole trade in 97.73, what am I going to do? I'm going to take a quarter off, bring my stops to break even. If the market comes back and takes me out, no harm, no foul. But I was right on my initial inclination, and I will always take something off the table. Now, one can argue, Mike, well, why would I reduce my position size if I still like to trade? Can't I just bring down my stop? I, it's my, again, my personal humble belief is that you're really doing yourself a disservice by just bringing down your stop. I'll very rarely just do that. I'll typically take a piece of the trade off, then bring down the stop. Why? Because if the trade completely reverses and comes right back after you were up, you know, a quarter of the ATR, you're walking away with nothing. Even though your initial inclination on the trade was right, that's not what you want to do. You always want to be on the defensive. Oh, okay, my first target was um, 97.73. Cool, I'm going to do something there. Not necessarily going to close out the whole position, but I'm going to take a little bit off, bring my stops down to break even or better, and move on. Market opened this week. We broke down below it again. Okay, cool, I'm going to hold on. Guess what? As soon as we hit 97.40, I took off another piece of that trade and we put our stop against the range highs for the week. Ultimately, like I said, I was looking for a move into the 97 handle. If I was patient, you know, I would have gotten pretty darn close. I think the low was 97.07 or 97.08 uh, before this thing rebounded. Um, but just kind of a lesson, a kind of a quick walkthrough of how uh, we look to trade these positions. Now on a day like today when you get US CPI data, if you're not pre-positioned for these moves, guys, it's a pure gamble, okay, it's pure gamble. Now, I want to caveat that by saying it's based on what price action does. For example, Friday we were looking to fade a rally, right? And in fact, in some of this trade, even in dollar yen, for example, today, I was looking, you know, for a little bit of pop to try to get back on the short side. Well, you really didn't get much of that pop before it broke below. Um, Questions. I'm going to stop for questions here. I've kind of been talking for a while. Pooja says, very helpful point about time spent at the trend lines. I'm always confused when price gets to a trend line. And Pooja, that's you know completely normal. It happens to all of us. And again, we never will know heading into a trend line, guys, if the market will, will hold it or not. All we can do is identify uh, the technical significance of that region and play what price action is saying. Price action is going to tell us whether it's going to hold or not. Um, which is why I'm not a real big fan of just, you know, leaving an entry at resistance and hoping that price will spike into there. I kind of want to see price react there on the pullback. My stop wants to be against that high if I really do think we've made a more concerted high at price. The price has got to suggest that, right? My, my feelings, my hopes, none of that matters. Um, so I digress. Uh, Iman with a question here saying, Iman saying, I notice when you do analysis for any pair, sometimes you go back to the seven or ten years ago to see highs or lows of that year and match it with today's charts. Uh, where is the point? Should we also go many years back to have more confidence? It's so hard for me, it's so hard for me to do the same. So Iman, we do it here for you at Daily FX so you don't have to. We try to highlight these things for you. But um, this is what I'll say. This is what I'll say. It depends on the type of strategy that you're working with. Um, hey Sonny, great to see you in the room. Um, I am always of the mindset of the multi-time frame analysis approach. So the way I will always view markets is in the context of, well, here's what the weekly chart's saying. Okay, here's what the weekly chart's saying. Here's the weekly chart of the euro dollar that we've been talking about. This was presented on the uh, weekly technical perspective that I read on Mondays. Um, uh, Robbie's a big fan. Robbie's saying, uh, hi, Michael. Uh, yup, multi-time frame analysis is key. It's a big part of my trading strategy and why. Um, Iman, if you're looking to trade a position on an intraday basis for 
you know, a quarter of the daily R, you're looking to take an intra-week position, yeah, you're not going to be wanting to stare at a weekly chart for that trade. But anytime you are trading on any asset class, you need to be identified or you need to identify or at least be aware of where you are in trend. So Iman, that's why I look at these longer term charts. Um, I just want to, I mean, I'm not using this as an entry, right? This whole, this whole webinar today was about execution and really getting into the ins and outs uh, of when am I going to press short, when am I going to press long, when am I going to actually get into this position. Um, the weekly charts for me are for perspective, you know, seeing the tree through the forest, kind of taking a step back and seeing, okay, what's this thing been doing? All right, highlighting 120.42, highlighting 117.14, nice range to trade with. Well, that low converging on that, as we were heading into 124, or 120 we started to say, hey, big area of resistance, right? I want to start to look for a pullback. Does that mean I'm going to throw a short on 120 42, Hail Mary, and kind of just look for this thing to pull back? No. But the weekly chart is highlighting that as a key level. You jump down into the daily chart, you man. Now, all of a sudden, near-term slope off the lows is there as well. Well, wait one second. The weekly chart just said we had a resistance there. The daily chart's saying I got resistance there. Hmm. All right? Let me drill down deeper. And this is where we get into the ins and outs of wanting to get into the position. Right? We talked about that confluence region. We came, we tested the highs and failed uh, miserably. Um, you know, the close um, of that week saw a gap to the downside the following week. And... You know, what it might have been harder to try to get an entry on this one, certainly there was pl plenty of clear opportunities. Okay? And again, playing the spike reversals. When, where is the entry here? I wish you guys could kind of point on the screen. I got to give you a little quiz. Where is the entry on this trade? Okay, this is a 30 minute chart on the euro on that rally into 2042. We're looking for resistance at 2042. That's down here. Price broke through. Uh oh. Is it a breakout? We pulled back, we tried to make another run, and then we broke back below that low. This is the actual entry, 120.32. Where's the stop? It's got to be at 129, or 120.90. It's 60 pips. What do you do in that scenario if your limit is not 60 pips away? You simply don't take the trade. Okay, and being able to cut yourself off like that is critical in trading, guys. A lot of times you'll get everything that looks like it's lining up. You'll get divergence in momentum, um, which actually you did get, nah, not too strong, but you did get some divergence in momentum. Um, you know, you're getting that kickback in price, and sometimes you'll put your stop and it'll get triggered. That's the name of the game. Sometimes you'll get the initial target or the initial trigger to jump in, but your stop needs to be that 60 pips away. Well, I'm only looking to grab 40 on this. I can't take that trade. So the same type of analysis that provides us with identifying opportunities also will tell you when you don't have a good, a good shot. Again, I was right. You know, we wanted to see the euro move lower, but from a trading standpoint, if the setup is not there, you're only trading half, percent, half of the game, right? Direction's only half the game. Um, do you take any uh, notice for candle configurations for entry points? Andrew, great, great credit. Great question. Try saying that three times fast. Um, I do take four. I do take note of candlestick formations for sure. Um, I'm a big fan of taking a look, um, but more so. Uh, let me clarify that more so, Andrew, on the daily charts um, or even the four-hour charts when you get a decent outside day, uh, outside candle reversal. But there's been a few instances of um, you know candlestick formations that you definitely want to be very. Um, that have been very useful, at least in, in the near term. Um, a lot of those are usually the outside day reversals off resistance. A lot of those are, you know, posting a doji off resistance, um, you know, the fill of a gap high and a reversal to close lower. Yeah, this will help me identify and reaffirm my conviction on the trend, Andrew, but they will not have any impact on my entries. So to get back to the, to the topic of the webinar, uh, candlestick formations can be very helpful in helping you ascertain trend, for sure. Exhaustion, right? The outside day reversal off of key resistance is absolutely critical. Um, 
but it's not going to give you the trigger to get in and execute the trade. That always has to be reliant on what near-term price action is doing, and obviously having a momentum indicator to further help you with that, you know, is just an added tool. Um, Robbie says, LOL, I missed the best key to tell you when it's now time to short keys up around 120.80 area. Yeah, on the, on the, on the Euro. <laughs> um, listen, it was a gutsy call, you know, but um, yeah, there was opportunity to get in if you were quick on that first initial run into it. Mike, um, if you get an entry signal, but it makes a third new high, how do you decide to try again or not? Trevor, can you give me some more background information on that? What do you mean? So let's say you're talking about something like this where it breaks to the bottom and all of a sudden you think you're taking a short but it breaks the high again. Is that what you're talking about? Guess what, Trevor? On a trade like that, you eat the loss. You're gonna if, if this was a, something I was trading and I saw the break below this low and I was like, all right, cool, that's a nice entry. We got some divergence. His momentum was rallying. I'm going to take a short here with a tight stop against the highs, right? Got spiked out on this last rally here before pulling back. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm done. It just means like, oh, okay, I was right just a bit early. So now I gotta wait for another opportunity. If you don't get one, like you did here in dollar at, in DXY, so be it. So be it. Um, you know, deciding when not to take a trade, guys, or when to stand aside is just as critical as actually t as actually you know, pulling the trigger. Uh, being flat is a position. I hate cliches, but uh, it really does, you know, it really does, it, re it makes sense in this kind of market. Um, HL or LH breaks around trend lines. Um, you will find that works very well on higher time frames. I'm not sure what you mean by HL or, or LH. Explain that to me real quick. We'll find it very well in high time frames. Always, always, we we'll always talk about this. Daily closes, weekly closes are always going to be paramount on, on deciding and ascertaining larger term trends. Intraday, you know, usually an hourly close, uh, four hour close is even more conviction, but absolutely. Um, absolutely, I think that's. Uh, something that you'll always want to look to the longer term time frames for. Um, so we looked at dollar Swiss, uh, a look again at something like dollar CAD, you know, more specifically on dollar CAD on the weekly chart. Um, you know, this is another one that we've been following very closely, but on the weekly chart, just another example, you know, of talking about number of lines, number of times the, the market tests the trend line gives you further affirmation on, um, Okay, you mean higher lows and lower highs. I mean, I see what you mean. I see what you're. I see what you're saying. So that's just the basics, right? Of trying to identify trend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but looking at something like dollar uh, dollar CAD, tested one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. Right? What happens on the sixth? The break sees acceleration. For us to validate that, that's a legit break on the rally. It's got to hold his resistance. And this is why for the weekly chart this week for dollar CAD, all we've been saying is really want to see this thing hold below last week's high. If we do, it would suggest that this is a simple break of support, test support as former resistance, and move on. Okay. Um, so guys, we kind of covered over a lot of things today. I know uh, I got drawn over into a couple of different conversations on different things. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, let me know if you have any other specific questions. Uh, Kobus absolutely says, hi, Michael. Will this video be uploaded to YouTube today still? Uh, thanks. Yes, absolutely. It will be uploaded to YouTube and also will be published on DailyFX. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks. Guys, I want to let you know. Again, I'm going to drill this into your heads. I mean, this webinar is for you. Uh, the topics, the um, you know, themes discussed are all based on the feedback I get from you guys. So um, if there was something in today's webinar that kind of didn't jive or you would like to to delve deep, deeper into, let me know. Again, I leave these topics open. We kind of went through the basic, uh, you know, framework of the trade setup. Um, but I definitely want you guys keep uh, to keep benefiting from this. So again, bi-weekly, we'll be back up on two, in two weeks on Friday 
uh, probably more back to the 930 slot at that point. Um, and again, you know, we'll go over uh, more of a Q&A type of uh, webinar for your questions. And as always, uh, throughout the course of the week, guys, feel free to send me feedback, things you'd want to discuss in these webinars. Uh, I'll be more than happy to oblige. Um, so we don't take trades at the support or resistance or a trend line. Wait for price actions, then execute. So Keen, all I'm saying is this. You know my strategy. Support trend lines, or support and resistance is everything. All I'm saying is that support is meant to be broken, right? Resistance is meant to be broken. So in trying to ascertain whether the line is going to hold or not, those are the things I want to talk about today. Um, again, the basics. The more times it's tested, the, you know, the more affirmed you are on that slope. And certainly when you see the break, the more affirmed you are that when you get that break, you'll see acceleration. With the same respect, the more time that's spent at a trend line, like in Aussie dollar, again, I'll bring that example up on the intraday charts that we talked about, right? Uh, the more time that's spent at the trend line, well, that's an indication that, you know, the efficacy is actually starting to wane a little bit. And that's going to be, um, um, you know, really what you want to kind of focus on as, as, as fueling the upside break. Uh, I should make questions in the future. Still building confidence in my trading, uh, looking for the right questions. Thank you, sir. Have a nice weekend, says JD. And I encourage all you guys to do that, um, you know, for... Um, for the future uh, webinars. Keen, I'm going to show you an example. Keen seems to have a very, um, he's really interested in, in these trend line breaks or resistance. Let me show you an example today in a, in a radical trade. How about that? Ethereum. Uh, this is a trade that I highlighted uh, yesterday here on Daily FX with the Ethereum uh, pending price breakout. How did I know that? Well, we were sitting within the monthly opening range, which is taking shape just below a critical resistance level. 312 into 320 represented a 618 extension from the advance off that September low and the 618 retracement of the September sell-off, my favorite confluence trades. So when you have the monthly opening range setting up just below this, we obviously tested 287 as support on three different occasions, really set the focus on this range. And as we said, you know, you look for the range break. If we were to break the downside, you have to respect to move lower, but our, our favored move was a topside breach. Okay, so looking at this trade, again, um, you know, looking, we had the risk for the pullback, but ultimately you wanted to be long on, uh, or look for long entries on a move lower into support, or on a break and a retest of the opening range highs. I kind of try to spell it out as much as I can, you know, without getting in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Here's Ethereum today. Okay, what happened? What happened? 312, 320 was the resistance range, right? Keen, look what happened. You broke resistance. Are you going to chase here? Am I going to take a, a trade, um, you know, long at 322 with my stop where, Keen? Where am I going to put my stop? Down here? No, I'm not willing to take a, a, big, a big stop on that. No way. So we have identified that the, that the range did indeed break, but I need price action to tell me what to do. So looking at this on the 30-minute chart, there was ample opportunity on the pullback here. It tested that region as support. Maybe that's not the first time you want to enter it. You want to see a little bit more of a struggle. We rallied it, tested it as support again. This is where I'd be putting in entry on this last recovery here. Long at 326, stop below 320. Your next upside target is 350. More than enough room to maintain that risk to reward ratio. Does that make sense on how to trade a breakout? Um, he says, yep, thanks. Um, the other thing is, let's take a look again also at, um, so again, just to kind of put things in perspective, you know, Ethereum from yesterday's uh, setup, yeah, that thing is still right on point, right on point. So you saw the top side break. You're basically looking right now for this rally. It's stretched somewhere in the 35th, uh, 350, 354 zone as initial area of resistance. What are those levels defined by? Well, it's 100% extension of the advance off the low. Excuse me. And 
It's the reversal day closed, that massive reversal day that we made back here on September 2nd, the close of that session after making, um, you know, the, basically testing the record highs, uh, those tend to be very critical um, regions of resistance as well. So, and that's the, the resistance re region that you have highlighted there on the report. So no change to any of those levels from yesterday, guys. Um, thanks. I like that. Simple, says Lucy. I, I mean, I, I try to break it down as simple as possible. So um, you're welcome. You're the welcome. One other thing I just want to talk about real quick, another trade that we've been following, uh, is Bitcoin. I mean, Again, the question was, Mike, how the hell do I trade the breakout here on the move above the record high? And the answer to, to I'll give you again is, if you weren't already long, there was nothing to do. And you have to be willing to be okay with that. Um, you know, the, the top side targets, and yesterday again, to subscribers, we, get, we gave them one word of advice, hold them if you got them. Next top side targets, basically the 58 handle which is a sliding parallel of the same slope we've been following off the lows here. And lo and behold, look where we found resistance today. Okay, so um, again, just to kind of bring it back to the uh, Bitcoin report from earlier this week, 49.79 was the initial record high close. We sailed through that. 53.75 was the initial target. Next upside level was that parallel, and then again, we added on that parallel last night, extending off of the highs that we made uh, from August to finally give us, um, you know, that last, that last area of resistance. From here, and like I l noted um, last night, guys, from here, you're completely reliant on slope. You're in un- Charted territory where, you know, we've never seen highs at this level. You have no lateral levels to work with beyond this. There's no measured moves even to kind of really consider. So we'll have to work on much more near-term price action to give us an indication of what we want to do. Um, for the record, if you are holding longs here, again, an area of resistance you really want to be mindful of, maybe taking some off the table, maybe bringing up your stops, but certainly a very critical level here um, with where we are. Richard says, are you comfortable tra uh, taking counter trend trades based on opening ranges or breaks of support and resistance? And my question or my answer to you, Richard is absolutely, absolutely hundred percent. Okay. But the caveat, you're trading on lower leverage, right? You're more meticulous on your entries. Why? Because it's a less forgiving position because you're trading against the trend. So any counter trend trades I take, Richard, are going to be lower in leverage. And again, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of trading with the trend is that obviously as the market continues to move higher, you can always, you know, bring up your stops, take a little bit off and let the market extend. You always, you know, one of the things that we've seen looking at the performance of retail traders over time is that actually more often than not, they're actually right in the direction, but their losses way outweigh their gains. So a good way of kind of you know stopping yourself from doing that is yeah on the trend that's on a trade that you have entry that's going with the broader trend, sure that one will be a little bit more sizable on the leverage, right? Um, but when I'm counter trend trading, I'm I'm in a different mindset, okay? I'm much more nimble, I'm much more attentive to what near term price action is saying, and mostly and most importantly, I'm I'm using lower leverage. Rich, does that make sense? I hope that offers some. Uh, Uh, some clarity. Mohammed says, when you have a position and it's going your way, then the rumor comes out. The market reverses and stops, take you out. But then the rumor is unreal and the market starts going your way again. When do you decide to re-enter? Mohammed, the same way I decided to enter on the first time, right? Now, that kind of situation is the king of what stokes a behavior I like to call revenge trading, where now all of a sudden, you start getting yourself in a position where, oh, I just got stopped, but it came right back. I'm going to jump in, you know, at a crap entry just because I, I, I was right. I was right. Resistance held. It just stopped me out for no reason. Every trade needs to be taken out on its own merits. The market doesn't care that you were in the position and it reversed on you, right? So if the market pulls back again, you still have to wait for the same types of stuff we talked about today. You still have to wait for a rally back into a decent position. I can take a new short. Uh, against the conviction stop. 
Okay, can you give an example in gold? Where is it likely uh, the level will reverse? So Keen, I'll give you an example, and this will be the last one, guys. I'll have to wrap things up, but this is the trade that we've been looking at in um, in bullion prices, and certainly the price action again here has been just in you know ridiculously clean. Uh, this is a basic parallel extending off the highs here. If you take that parallel and drop it off to the low, really nice pivot. Saw acceleration, support, support, support. Resistance just missed here today. So how would a view of trade this trade? Well, on this type of trade, we obviously marked uh, the long side as a breach of the descending channel that we were following for a couple of weeks uh, in gold prices. And the reaction off that, what do we want to see? A break of resistance. We checked it as support. We rallied higher again. On the pullback here, we checked support again. Once we broke above this, stop against the low, and you're looking for a move into 1290. We got it. Uh, I still tend to think you look for, uh, what am I saying? Uh, 1297 was the level that we wanted to see hit. Here's the market say topping 1297, but just above is that near-term channel resistance. So look, you could get another spike into this region. Do I want to look to play along there? No, right? I want to be mindful of a possible pullback off that resistance level because we've already seen one, two, you'll call that a three, but typically when you see this, it's called a raised ceiling. It means the market wasn't quite able to make into resistance before pulling back. A lot of times will be right before the onset of a near-term correction or a near-term pullback. So I do think you can see this thing drift a little bit lower ultimately. Uh, as you guys have read, if you guys check out our new quarterly forecasts, um, you know, myself and David Song write the gold forecast every year and certainly or every quarter and for this quarter um, you know the broader picture still remains constructive above 1240 and that's what we said back uh, at the start of the month so lo the lower parallel is a good level of entry objectively keen but what do we always have to remember man our stop so let's say this happens today or we get a drop into early trade next week and you get a drop into this region if you're comfortable taking a stop against that low that would be the next entry that would be the next entry, absolutely. With the same respect, if this rallies back into this high and fails, a break of that low with a stop against that high, we look to play the pullback. Again, lower leverage, right? Lower leverage. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Keen, great questions today. Robbie, same with you. Rich, uh, again, I encourage you guys to think about these questions throughout the trading week. When you're going through a position, you kind of think to yourself, well, you know, did I do that right or this didn't make sense? Just jot it down real quick. Uh, we'll be more than happy to have that discussion. Again, the next Foundations uh, of Technical Analysis webinar. Iman, uh, always a pleasure. I appreciate you and thank you so much. I will see you uh, next week. Again, 8.30 um, on Monday mornings. Uh, we will be back with the weekly strategy webinar um, where, we'll, again, we'll be purely market-based, guys. We talk about the setups that we look over for the week and what trades we're looking to get in uh, involved in. Thank you, Mike. A fountain of information, says Trevor. I appreciate that. Keen, same to you. Hassan, have a great weekend, guys, and I'll see you bright and early on Monday morning. Cheers.